All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining Audubon Great Lakes and MyBirds webinar on the Kirtland's Warbler this lunch hour. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. Welcome everyone. We appreciate you joining Audubon Great Lakes and My Birds webinar on the Kirtland's Warbler. Um, we'll get started in another minute, waiting for a few more folks to join us, and then we'll get the webinar started. I get the, the ball rolling. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Rowan and I want to welcome you to Audubon Great Lakes and My Birds webinar on the Kirtland's Warbler in partnership with National Audubon, Kirtland's Warbler Alliance, the Bahamas National Trust, and American Bird Conservancy. Thanks so much for spending the next hour with us. We're hoping that this webinar will be helpful because we know people are still spending more time outside and continuing to connect with nature closer to home. And with spring here, we know neotropical migrants like the Kirtland's warbler will be returning soon to Michigan and the Great Lakes region. The physical and mental health benefits to experiencing nature are also so important for everyone, and Audubon and MyBirds are committed to making the outdoors safe and welcoming for all. I'm the Michigan Conservation Manager for Audubon Great Lakes, and I manage the My Birds program, which is an outreach and engagement program presented by Michigan Department of Natural Resources Wildlife Division and Audubon Great Lakes. My Birds aims to increase all Michiganders' engagement in the understanding, care, and stewardship of public lands that are important for birds and people. And Audubon Great Lakes is a regional office of National Audubon, and we work across the five Great Lakes states to restore and protect birds in the places they need to thrive through on the ground conservation, outreach, engagement, policy, and advocacy. Uh, we have over 215,000 active members now across the region, over 50 chapters, and two nature centers. I will be your facilitator today with the help of Emily Osborne, our Senior Communications Manager, who will be monitoring the chat box and will help to facilitate the Q&A session at the end of the program. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This presentation is being recorded. All participants are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar. Please take a moment to locate the participant and chat function on the Zoom platform to actively participate. If you'd like to send a question or comment to the facilitator or panelists, please use the chat box. If you're participating via Facebook Live, please submit your question or comment in the comment section. We're going to be monitoring the chat box throughout this webinar and the comments on Facebook, so please be respectful while participating. We're also going to review the questions you've submitted in the chat box during the Q&A session, and questions are going to be answered at the end of the presentation. If you want to take a moment to test out that chat function, you can introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, tell us your name, where you're from, and what spring migrant you're looking forward to seeing over the next month. Also, if you want to uh, close out that sidebar showing the chat, as I know for some it can be distracting, simply click on that chat icon again to close that sidebar. So today we're all here to chat about all things Kirtland's Warbler. 
Uh, we're going to learn about their identification, life history, conservation history, recovery efforts on the breeding grounds here in Michigan, um, but also on their wintering grounds in the Bahamas, and what the conservation team is working on now. We'll close it out with ways you can get involved and engaged with Kirtland's Warbler Conservation. And then at the end of the program, we're going to end things with a question and answer session. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Bill Rapai, who's the Executive Director of the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance. Bill, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my, as Aaron said, my name is Bill Rapay. I'm the Executive Director of the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance, and I'm also the book, author of a book on the Kirtland's Warbler. Uh, it's called The Kirtland's Warbler, Birds Fight Against Extinction and the People Who Saved It, which was published in 2012 by University of Michigan Press. Uh, when I got started on the book, um, I completed the book and, and uh, somebody said, no, you're not, you're not done here. Uh, you're, you're going to be around because the Jack Pine has a way of calling you back. And he was absolutely right. And uh, I am still involved in the Kirtland's Warbler now from a very different way. And um, instead of writing about the Kirtland's Warbler and the, the passion of the people who saved it from extinction, I, I am now one of those people who are passionately working to conserve and create the future for the Kirtland Swarbler. Next, please. So what does the uh, Kirtland Swarbler Alliance do? Well, we were created about 10 years ago now to simply help support the conservation team. There are some things that the uh, government agencies simply cannot do or are not well equipped to do. So we try to help them fill those gaps. Uh, one of those, of course, is human dimensions. Um, it's not, it, not everything is about the birds. Sometimes it's helping people understand why uh, we have to continue to do the conservation work, even though the Kirtland's warbler is no longer endangered. And we're going to dip into that in a little bit. Uh, we also uh, work with state and federal lawmakers to help them understand what's happening with Kirtland's warbler uh, uh, conservation, what the latest uh, techniques are. And uh, locally up in northern Michigan, we work with people to help them continue to see the economic benefits of Kirtland's warbler conservation. Money comes in from all over the country and all over the world for, for birders who want to see the Kirtland's warbler. Next, please. So how do you identify a Kirtland Swarbler? You know, I have to admit that I've been birding since I've been, you know, 18 years old, and I probably cannot do a good job of identifying birds by field marks. I just look at a bird and I say, Oh, that's a morning dove. That's a Kirtland Swarbler. That's a whatever. Um, and so, you know, forgive me if I haven't gotten all the, uh, the field marks memorized, but, um, I just, when I see a Kirtland's Warbler, I know it's a Kirtland's Warbler because uh, I look at the, the eye, uh, that, that half semicircle above and below the eye and that wonderful, beautiful uh, shade of slate blue gray back. Um, and, and of course there's that little black mark between the eye and the bill. Um, so I always know that that's a Kirtland's Warbler when I see one. Next please. Um, there are similar species in the jack pine, and when we were conducting the uh, Kirtland's Warbler Census last year, I was working to train volunteers to help with the, the Michigan DNR and the U.S. Forest Service. We wanted to make sure that they, that those volunteers were acquainted with all the other birds that could possibly con be confused with Kirtland's Warbler. And one of those species, of course, was the, the, uh, the, the prairie warbler. Um, but you can see that it's, it looks fairly different. It doesn't have that black face uh, and the slate gray back. It does have the, 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 the similar streaks down the breast, but there's not a lot that you can confuse a uh, prairie warbler and a Kirtland's Warbler. Next, please. Oops, we gotta wait for the arrows to pop up, I guess. Um, female prairie warbler. Um, is that a, no, it can't be a female prairie warbler. It says prairie warbler, what is that? Um, anyways, yes, olive gray uh, uh, upper parts. It's uh, not at all similar to Kirtland's warbler. Um, 
it's gray. It's more greenish than gray. It does have that that dark on the head and on the back, but it's it's uh, lacks that um, that black lore between the eyes and the, and the bill. When we trained the, spe the, the volunteers to identify the species, we uh, made sure that they knew the difference between the Kirtland's warbler song and the uh, uh, yellow-rumped warbler song because they both are very variable and they both have, sound very similar. So um, if you are out in the field in particular uh, and you think you hear a Kirtland's warbler song, you have to listen very, very closely to make sure that it, it is not a uh, calling yellow rumped warbler. Um, Aaron, can, can that uh, uh, be played? Yellow rumped warbler. But both the yellow rump warbler and the Kirtland's warbler have variations and uh, they can easily be confused with one another their songs. They're both a, a little bit high pitched and um, yeah, easy con to confuse. Next, please. Oh, palm warbler. Palm warbler. There's a, a question from somebody who uh, asked how to elaborate on how people can volunteer. We'll get to that in a little while. Thank you very much for asking that question. Um, pine warbler, uh, very, very different. You don't have the, uh, the black uh, and the, the slate gray on the back. Um, and uh, the, the uh, flanks, the, the, more the, the, the spots down the side are more blurred and then the Kirtland's warbler, those, those uh, uh, spots on the flanks of Kirtland's warbler are much more precise. Magnolia warbler, can't mistake Magnolia warbler for Kirtland's warbler, even though you have, you know, those, those lovely uh, 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 spots coming down the, the breast on the side. But when you see the, the Magnolia warbler, it has that incredible white patch above and behind the eye that gives it away. And there's much, much more white on the wing than there is on a Kirtland's warbler. Female Magnolia warbler, yep, similar. Um, that The white patch above and behind the eye and that larger white patch on the wing is a sure giveaway. So this is the Kirtland's warbler nesting habitat. Um, th that is Sarah Rockwell. I spent some time in the field with her while she was working on her PhD at the University of Maryland. Uh, and you get an idea of what the uh, Kirtland's warbler habitat looks like from Sarah standing there. She's a, a five foot, 10 inch woman. And so you get a, a, a feel for how high the trees are uh, and how open the, the fields can be in certain spots. They love the patchy, scrubby, young jack pines uh, and in front of Sarah, you can see the, um, the blueberries that grow in uh, the habitat. And those blueberries are important uh, food source for the Kirtland's warbler. The population for the Kirtland's warbler will always be small because they want to nest on the ground underneath the overlapping branches of young jack pines between, say, five and 15 years old, when the trees begin to reach about 20 feet high, those lower branches that provide cover for the nests, those that cup on the ground begin to die off. And when those, those lower branches begin to die off, they no longer provide cover for the Kirtland's warbler nest and the Kirtland's warbler then will uh, abandon that stand of jack pine and go find someplace else. But the, uh, the, that combination of young jack pines on quick draining sandy soil is not common. So the population will always be self-limiting. Um, 
the Kirtland's warbler is a bird of the dense underbrush. It will spend time close to the, a lot of time close to the ground, but it will also sit up on snags and, and look around and sing. It's a, the way that it advertises itself. You know, it's like, okay, I'm over here, ladies. Um, this is my territory. Other guys, you stay out. Um, and one of the things that we did early on in Kirtland's World of Conservation is we planted jack pines exclusively on these large uh, plantations in northern Michigan. And we didn't leave any old dead trees or any deciduous trees. And, and the biologists were like, well, we gave the birds this incredible jack pine forest. Why, why are they rejecting it? Well, they rejected it because they love to sit up high on dead branches like you see here. And sing and overlook their territory. Uh, you can always tell a Kirtland's warbler because it's regularly pumping its tail as it's sitting there, it's singing, it's pumping its tail. Um, and when you find a stand of young jack pines, you can often find as many as 30 or 40 pairs in a, in a large stand because um, they, they like, even though they um, like to spread out and they want their own territories, they kind of like to be colonial. They like to be living in close to one another. It's kind of odd. This is a Kirtland's warbler on her nest. Um, you can see that uh, she builds this uh, wonderful little cup on the ground. Uh, and the, the pairs are, are seasonally monogamous. So they will pick a different uh, pair. Uh, they, they will pair up with a different bird every year. Um, and they'll often have uh, four or five eggs. Next slide, please. Uh, this is um, a, a plant that is uh, in the diet in the Bahamas. Uh, they, in the Bahamas, they eat a lot of fruit, the, the uh, wild sage and the white torch. Um, they also eat uh, insects, arthropods, etc. cetera. Um, and in, in Northern Michigan, they're also eating a lot of fruit, uh, blueberries in particular, and also a lot of insects. Um, so it's uh, a, a mix of, of both uh, fruit and, and insects. Longevity, um, this is a, a, a new piece of news. The oldest recorded bird that has ever been um, seen is um, a 12 year old female that was captured here in Michigan on June 22nd, 1990. Uh, Carol Bassetti banded a half after hatch year female while banding her nestlings um, on the Ogemaw plantation in Ogemaw County. Uh, when she banded the bird, she gave it a unique color code. One yellow band was placed over an aluminum band on the female's left leg, and one yellow band was placed over a black band on the right. So each bird, when they are banded, is given a unique color code. No other bird would have had that same color code. She was last sighted in Northern Michigan on June 7th, 2001 by uh, John Probst, a biologist with the US Forest Service. She was in a different stand of jack pines, not all that far from where she was captured and banded by uh, Carol Bassetti. Um, we know that this female was old enough to breed in 1990, which would have made June 1989 the date to start the estimate of her age. Um, but so, we know that she was at least 12 years old when she was last seen, but we really don't know how old she would have been because we don't know how old she was when she was originally banded. Um, Probst noted that the, the, the color on this female was particularly intense and it looked more like a male, suggesting that older females can look more like males. Next, please. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the delisting of the Kirtland's warbler, but uh, after 47 years of being on the endangered species list, uh, it came off the endangered species list in October of 2019. The Kirtland's warbler was among the first species to be put on the endangered species list. Starting in uh, 1967, before the en Endangered Species Act was even in, uh, created in 1972, our first endangered species list was in 1967 and the Kirtland's warbler was a inaugural member of that class. Um, so it is no longer considered to be endangered today. The population is over 4,000 pairs. Uh, as recently as 1987, there were four, fewer than 4,000, uh, there are 4,000 birds in the population today. As, as recently as 1987, there were fewer than 400 birds. So you can see that we've come a long way.
Next, please. So because we've created, um, we, we have this new reality, we, we're no longer um, working to keep this bird from going extinct. We now have a bird that its population is considered small, but secure. We have to build a new model for endangered spe for recovered species uh, conservation. Um, the Kirtland's warbler is considered to be a conservation reliant species. And if there's one concept I want you guys to take away from this today is that the Kirtland's warbler is a conservation reliant species. It cannot survive on its own out there without human um, intervention on its behalf. Next, please. The conservation reliant species was developed by this gentleman here, J. Michael Scott. He was a uh, scientist with the US uh, uh, Geological Survey, but also a professor uh, at the University of Idaho. And he led the uh, recovery of the California condor. And he's uh, working to conserve native Hawaiian birds now. But as he was working on the California condor, he realized that about 80% of the birds and other species that are on the endangered species list are um, rely on continual human intervention on their behalf. And because of that, they cannot come off the endangered species list without having a plan for their continued conservation efforts as, as time goes on for as far as we can see into the future. So that's what we're doing today. We're building on this concept by Jay Mickle Scott to create a, a new model for recovered species conservation. Next, please. So all of these recovered species require um, human intervention for predator control, parasite control, habitat management, um, and, and these things are required even after the population has achieved, uh, you know, he, he realized these while he was working on the, on the uh, California condor project. And um, next one, please. The, the problem is there was really no, uh, nothing built into the Endangered Species Act that would help these species come off the endangered species list and have them stand on their own. When we created the endangered species list, it was intended to be a hand up. Once the population recovered, they could go on their merry way, everything would be happy. But because these species depend on continual human intervention, there was no plan. So what we're doing now is we're working with um, the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team, ABC, um, the Bahamas National Trust, to build a new model for recovered species um, conservation. Next, please. I have this feeling I'm going on a little bit too long. Um, so what causes an animal or plant to be put on the endangered species list? Well, there are four things essentially, habitat loss, human persecution, a competition from invasive species and environmental factors such as um, uh, you know, chemicals, things like DDT. Next, please. So with the Kirtland's warbler, we can point to two of the four. Um, human persecution is not one of those things. Competition from habitat loss is, and competition from invasive species is. Um, we know that everything, next, next slide, please. We know that everything in this landscape is built to burn. We have taken fire out of the landscape and because there was no fire, the landscape was not allowed to uh, renew itself and therefore there was no new habitat for Kirtland's warblers. Next, please. Everything in the, the jack pine landscape in northern Michigan is built to burn. When the uh, fire sweeps across the landscape and uh, burns the, the crowns of the jack pine trees, it allows light to hit, come down to the ground and uh, rejuvenate all those plants, the, the blueberries, the sedges, everything that's on the ground, it comes back and rejuvenates itself from its roofs. They may have been... Um, dormant for 30 years, but they come right roaring right back. Um, so fire is just an absolute critical part of the way that this, uh, this, this ecosystem re renews itself. And if we have too many people living in that ecosystem, we can't allow fire to spread across the, the, the landscape because it's too much of a danger. So we have to squelch it. That means we have to manage the ecosystem. We have to manage the jack pines and create new jack pine forests for the Kirtland's warblers and the other species that live there. Next, please. So the impact of the brown-headed cowbird was also 
incredibly powerful for the Kirtland Swirler. Um, the cowbird um, followed the bison around the, the Great Plains. And uh, instead of uh, stopping to um, uh, build a nest, lay eggs, incubate, raise the young, and risk having that bison herd be 100 uh, miles or more away, they would have, uh, they just found another bird's nest to lay their egg in. And when they moved into northern Michigan after the bison herds were pretty much uh, eliminated during the late 19th century and logging created a new prairie in northern Michigan, they moved into northern Michigan and they found the Kirtland's warbler and well, they found a species that they had not uh, had no contact with and the Kirtland's warbler had no defense for. Next one, please. So in 1923, a young man by the name of Nathan Leopold was the first to identify the threat presented by the cowbird. Nathan Leopold was a student at the University of Michigan uh, studying under Norman Wood, who discovered the breeding grounds of the Kirtland's warbler in northern Michigan. And uh, Nathan Leopold really was the first to realize the threat the cowbird presented to the Kirtland's warbler and predicted that without some kind of of uh, cowbird management, the cowbird would eventually cause the Kirtland's warbler to go uh, extinct. And in the 1970s and 60s, uh, fewer than one Kirtland's warbler was fledging from every nest. And by um, any stretch of the imagination, any kind of, of a population scenario you run, that is simply not enough to sustain a, a, a healthy population. Next, please. So you can probably spot the cowbird egg in this Kirtland's warbler nest. It is the one on the left. It's a little bit bigger, but you can see how similar they are. The same colors, speckle, etc. Very, very close. So if that one cowbird egg is in this nest with three Kirtland's warblers, um, it is likely that only one Kirtland's warbler would be um, would would fledge. If there were two cowbird eggs in that nest it's unlikely any cow uh, in Kirtland's warblers would survive to fledge into adulthood. The, the cowbird egg will hatch first, the cowbird young will demand more food, and eventually the young cowbirds will push the Kirtland's warblers out of the nest. So if you're an adult Kirtland's warbler, uh, you're female, you've laid three eggs, and all of a sudden you come back to your nest and there's a fourth egg in there, you say to yourself, wait a minute, I only laid three eggs, what's this fourth egg doing here? Well, it's likely that the cowbird, the Kirtland's warbler laid four eggs and the cowbird came in and laid one of its eggs and then removed one of the Kirtland's warbler eggs to, dis to disguise the fact that it had been there. So yes, the cowbird is a little bit devious in its nesting strategy. Next, please. So very quickly, how did we get here? This gentleman right here, Norman Wood, uh, discovered the nesting areas of uh, the Kirtland's warbler. You got to remember, in the in the 19th century, people spread out all across northern northern um, North America to learn about the flora and fauna of this continent. Uh, but we we knew pretty much everything there was to know about the basic biology of most birds in North America, but we knew, didn't know much about the Kirtland's warblers. Um, and so it was a mystery and a little bit of a parlor game to guess where Kirtland's warblers were nesting among uh, ornithologists. Well, one day a student at the University of Michigan was uh, trout fishing on the Osaba River and he hears a bird singing that he does not recognize. So what does he do? He gets out his gun and he shoots it. This is the way bio, the ornithology was done in the 19th and early 20th century. He brings the, uh, the study skin back to Ann Arbor, presents it to Nor Norman Wood. Norman Wood immediately identifies it as a Kirtland's warbler and says, aha, we may have finally discovered the breeding grounds of the Kirtland's warbler. He immediately makes plans to go to Northern Michigan and discovers the breeding grounds of the Kirtland's warbler. Next, please. And this, when he got to Northern Michigan, um, he had one of his assistants dig up the first nest that he found of a Kirtland's warbler, and he sent it back to the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History. And it, it is in the um, in the, the the in a case at the University of Michigan. Um, you can go and see it and and study it. But there it is, the, the first known nest of a Kirtland's warbler. Next, please. Uh, after um, 
Norman Wood studied the Kirtland's warblers. A dentist from Battle Creek, who was president of Michigan Audubon, began to, to research Kirtland's warblers. He was the first person to put a band on Kirtland's warbler to study their movements. Uh, Lawrence Walkinshaw, uh, you can uh, go next one, please. Lawrence Walkinshaw stepped aside when Jocelyn Van Tyne began to uh, study the Kirtland's warbler. Uh, Jocelyn Van Tyne was curator of birds at the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History. He took over when Norman Wood retired. And he's a, an ornithologist who was just absolutely uh, known and honored. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the American Ornithological Society, one of their top research awards is the Van Tyne Award. He began to research the Kirtland's warbler in the 1930s, and um, he gathered the information with the intent of writing the, the uh, premier book on Kirtland's warbler biology. Unfortunately, he died at a very young age of heart disease. Next, please. Uh, but uh, working alongside of him in the field was this gentleman here, Harold Mayfield, a uh, business executive from uh, Toledo, Ohio. He had a stroke at a very young age, so he decided that instead of, of playing semi-pro basketball, which was one of the things that he did, he decided that he was going to take on bird studies. So he began working with Van Tyne in the field and he learned everything that he could about the uh, Kirtland Swarbler and he continued Van Tyne's uh, field work and he wrote the definitive book on the, on the history and biology of, of the Kirtland Swarbler. Essentially he opened up his field uh, notes and just put it all on paper. Next please. But there are a couple of things that are part of uh, Mayfield's leg legacy. One of them is that he persuaded the, the state of Michigan to make sure that there would always be some land in rotation for the Kirtland's warbler. This is one of the things that prevented the Kirtland's warblers from going extinct. The, the state of Michigan, the, the conservation department before it became the DNR, began to replant young jack pines every year in order for there to always be Kirtland's warbler habitat. Next. The other thing that he did in 1951 is he created the first Kirtland's Warbler census. It was the first time that anybody had attempted to um, do a census on a complete population. Now think how, how difficult it would be to do a census on the robin, which is spread out across North America or some other species. But we know where the Kirtland warblers can be found. They can be found in young jack pine trees in northern Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ontario. They're easy to find. We can listen to their calls and, and identify the, the singing males. And so it was relatively easy to do. And by following the census, next please. Uh, by following the census, we, we knew exactly how many birds there were in the population, or we had a really good idea of how many birds there were in the population. Unfortunately, in the 1970s and 80s, the Kirtland's warbler became a symbol for conflict with conservation. Um, in the 1970s, the vast majority of the Kirtland's warbler population was nesting on Camp Grayling, uh, the Michigan National Guard base near Grayling. Why were they there? Because the, the uh, Camp Grayling, the, the military was conducting live fire and they were, because they were conducting live fire, it would let, regularly set the forest on the base on fire. It would uh, sweep across the landscape and create new jack pine habitat for the Kirtland's warblers. So at one point, realizing that the, the Kirtland's warbler was, this was the Kirtland's warbler stronghold, the Michigan DNR went onto the base and said, no, you are going to close off your tank range. You're going to close off your military range because we have this endangered species uh, nesting on your base. You can imagine how unpopular this decision was with the Michigan National Guard, particularly during the 1970s when there was civil unrest, the Vietnam War, etc. Go ahead. And unfortunately in 1980 there was this tragedy, the Mac Lake fire. Um, the U.S. Forest Service south of Mayo, Michigan, set a fire to create new habitat for the Kirtland's warbler. It was on an area that had actually been cut, and they were just uh, burning off the slash, the remains, the branches, the stumps, etc. And unfortunately, the fire got out of control. The wind picked up. It caused the fire to jump the road, and pretty soon it was spreading um, all the way across northern Michigan. It wiped out the town of, of Mac Lake. It killed one U.S. Forest Service worker. It was an absolute tragedy. People turned, people who lived in the area turned on the Kirtland's warbler. You know, they, they began to cuss out that damn bird. Why would the government uh, burn us out of our houses for one little bird kind of argument? Uh, 
But what the Mac Lake fire did is it helped us understand, it helped biologists understand what it was that the Kirtland's warbler needed to survive. We got an in, in, insight into the natural way the, the habitat worked. And that is what saved the Kirtland's warbler. That, that fire was an absolute tragedy, but it came along at the right time. Next, please. So you can see how the progress has been made. Uh, we've gone from that fire in 1980. It took about uh, 10 years for that, uh, that uh, habitat really to kick in from the Mac Lake fire. But once that Mac Lake fire kicked in, boom, the population just began to grow. We learned so much from it. We, we discovered the secret sauce and, and we soon began to mimic the Mac Lake fire in the way we planted jack pines and the way we left um, uh, old trees, the old deciduous trees in the area so that the curtains warblers would have snags and you can see the population has just continued to grow. Next, please. So delisting was required by law. Once the Kirtland's warbler population reached about 1,500 pairs, delisting was required. Um, so in uh, October 2019, uh, the Kirtland's warbler came off the endangered species list, which was just you know, a tremendous achievement, but it also brings us to why, why we are here today, building this new model for conservation. Next, please. So, uh, of course, we ask the question, what does this one bird matter? Aldo Leopold said it, of course, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. But I got a different insight on why this one bird matters. After writing my book on the Kirtland's warbler, I wrote a book on invasive species in the Great Lakes. And I learned that every time an invasive species comes in and causes a native species to, to go extinct or to be extirpated from the, the Great Lakes, it, it lessens the Great Lakes ability to recover from a shock. It, it hurts the Great Lakes ability to act naturally. So if the Kirtland's warbler somehow were to disappear from the, the Jack Pine ecosystem, the impact would be, okay, there's an out, uh, 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 outbreak of Jack Pine budworm. What, in, what birds would be there to eat those Jack Pine budworms to control that? What, what influence would what would happen if the Kirtland's warbler were not there? How would that ecosystem change? The Kirtland's warbler helps to keep that ecosystem the way it is in balance, and that's why it matters. Um, and I think that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Bill. And yeah, we'll pass things over to Giselle, who's going to give us a little bit of background information about where Kirtland's warblers spend the rest of their life cycle when they're not here in the Great Lakes region. Giselle? Hi, everyone. Good morning um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Giselle Dean. I am a science officer at the Bahamas National Trust. Um, and if you've never heard of the Bahamas National Trust, I will talk about it in just a second. Um, next, please. Uh, but the main focus of this presentation is um, the sustaining Kirtland's warbler winter habitat in the Bahamas, which is my current main project uh, at work. Um, next, please. So this is just a short overview of what the presentation will entail. Uh, just a quick overview of what the Bahamas National Trust is. Um, the, and then the Kirtland's warbler, what it does down here, um, what our current research on the bird is, and then some outreach work that we have been conducting um, for the duration of this project and uh, long into the past. Um, next, please. So the Bahamas National Trust. Um, the Bahamas National Trust, or BNT, uh, is the National Parks Management Agency of the Bahamas. Um, Unlike a lot of other management park uh, park management agencies in the in the world, um, the BNT is not a government agency. Um, we are actually a nonprofit organization, uh, which allows us to apply for funding outside of government, um, and we have a membership base as well. Uh, the BNT also um, was mandated by an act of Parliament in 1959. Um, and the story behind that is basically the main island of New Providence, um, where the capital of Nassau is in the Bahamas, uh, was getting built up. And so a team of researchers went out, um, did some surveys, um, 
and found this beautiful place uh, pictured in this, this photo. This is the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, um, where those researchers were like, you got to put that aside um, so that people have something to enjoy in the future. Um, and so that is uh, kind of the story behind the BNT. Um, there was also another part to the story where flamingos um, were being hunted, um, but I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, so this is a map of the current national parks we have in the Bahamas. There are 32 across the um, archipelago um, from Walker's Key uh, all the way up north to Great Inagua, in, which is the furthest south. Um, next, please. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two of our most special parks, um, the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, which was the first national park established in the Bahamas in 1958. Um, it is a no-take marine reserve, and it is our most visited park, um, extremely popular with uh, boaters and people who own yachts, um, and has actually won an award for its management. Next, please. And then secondly is the uh, Inagua National Park, which um, is home to the third largest breeding colony of West Indian flamingos in the world. Um, and uh, it actually encompasses most of the island of Inagua um, and uh, its salt pond, Lake Rosa, which is just home to hundreds and thousands and of uh, species of birds and um, especially wetland birds like the flamingo. Uh, next, please. But I am here to talk about Kirtland's warblers and in the Bahamas. Uh, so as we all know, Kirtland's warbler breed in a very small and scattered area around the Great Lakes, which uh, Bill just spoke about from May to September. They then fly nearly 1500 miles south to the Bahamas. This isn't an entirely accurate uh, animation uh, to the Bahamas. Uh, next please. Uh, where they spend most of the year, about seven months in the Bahamas um, and eat lots of fruit and insects. Uh, in the Bahamas, they mostly spend their times on the islands of Eleutha, Cat Island, San Salvador, and Long Island. Um, but they are known to occur on the other islands of the Bahamas. Uh, we're not sure at the moment how many Kirtlands use which islands. Um, and so some of our future work will involve visiting these other islands to see um, how much Kirtlands use them. Um, and outside of the Bahamas, the Kirtlands warblers are actually extremely rare. Um, and I will talk about why that is in just a second. Um, uh, but one showed up in Jamaica, I think it was a couple of years ago and has really big news in the birding world, um, especially regionally in the Caribbean. Um, and so I'm trying to get the term a uh, seasonal endemic to get uh, to catch on for Kirtland's warbler because it is it is pretty much endemic to the Bahamas um, during the wintering season. Next, please. So why does the Kirtland's warbler love the Bahamas so much? Well, here in the Bahamas, uh, they use a short scrubby, scrubby habitat, much like the, the breeding habitat up north. Um, but instead of pine forest, they actually use coppice, which is just what we call a broadleaf forest. Um, and specifically, they really like a habitat that was recently disturbed. Um, so that's either uh, by fire, like Bill just spoke about again, or uh, some place that was cleared down and is being regrown, or um, other places that is constantly disturbed and the vegetation is kept low, such as uh, being grazed by goats on farms. Um, so their habitat is typically dominated by early successional species, um, which basically is a fancy way to say plant species that are first to come up after an area has been cleared, either by fire or clearing, etc. The most important of these uh, bird of these plants uh, um, are three. Uh, which are called black torch, which is pictured here in this photo. Next, please. White sage, next. And snowberry. Um, these three plants are very important to Kirtland's warbler's diets as they spend their time in the Bahamas. They can consume the fruits from these three plants as well as insects that visits the fruits and the flowers. Next. So a little bit about the current work that's going on in the Bahamas. Um, <clears throat> there are five goals uh, to the sustaining Kirtland's warbler winter habitat um, as listed on screen at the moment. Um, I actually just returned from the island of Eleuthera on Friday, which is where the project is taking place. 
Um, I spent two weeks just about there with uh, three team members where we set out to uh, work on goals two, three, and four. Um, so that's monitoring Kirtland's warbler habitat, uh, comparing bird densities um, at the project sites, and engaging the public on Kirtland's warbler conservation. Um, next, please. So just to talk a little bit about what's going on in the current project, um, we have uh, the Kirtland's monitoring, sorry, the Kirtland's warbler habitat monitoring surveys. Um, we are monitoring four sites across the um, south portion of Eleuthera. Uh, two of these sites are farms. Uh, they're actually specifically ungulate farms. So goats, sheep, there's a sheep, goats, sheep. Uh, there are a couple of cows here and there as well. Um, and uh, the other two sites are just control sites, um, which have older disturbance and are composed of uh, mainly coppice, like I mentioned before. Um, at each of the sites, there are six points, um, which means there are four, 24 points total. Um, the farms are actually different ages. So um, the old farm, as we call it, is about 20 years old. And there's a new farm that's less than five years old. Um, <clears throat> there was originally supposed to be uh, two sets of uh, four sets of surveys um, with two each year. Two took place last year, but only one was able to take place this year um, due to a number of different factors. Um, next, please. But the, there are three types of surveys that we conduct as part of these habitat monitoring efforts. Um, there are the avian point counts, which are, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> there are avian point counts, which is where we go and count birds, vegetation habitat classification, as well as uh, phenology fruit counts, which is basically just looking at how much fruit is available, um, specifically Kirtland's warbler fruit. Um, so here's the results of uh, some of the work that was done last year. Um, haven't had a chance yet to look at um, this year's results yet, um, or this year's data, uh, but we, what we can basically see is that um, one of our control sites, the site listed as um, MIN, um, had the highest species diversity um, in the early survey period or the first survey period, which was uh, end of February, beginning of March. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see there's a pretty big difference in the number of species, like about 22 versus 15. Um, and then the second survey period was conducted end of March to the beginning of April. Um, and this is last year. Like I said, we had to change it up a little bit this year. Um, other, the other sites are pretty consistent with their number of species across both survey periods. Next, please. Mm -hmm. So, uh, part of my project involves uh, engaging farmers on creating um, a plan to sustain Kirtland's warbler wintering habitat in Eleuthera for the next five years. Um, um, some of the, the work um, taking place as a series of workshops. Uh, some of this work is taking place as a series of workshops um, aimed at farmers to educate them on how their farms can help Kirtland's warblers and how Kirtland's warblers can help their farms. Um, the first workshop uh, took place at the beginning of February and there were nine participants. Um, they got a presentation much like this one as well another one as well as another one specifically on Bahamian birds. And afterwards, we went for a walk through one of the control sites at Sam Mingo Road or MIN, um, where it had the highest species diversity. Um, and sorry, excuse me. Um, sorry, <laughs> lost my place. Um, uh, yeah, they got a pres they got two presentations, and then we went for a walk through one of the study sites. Um, they, we didn't find any Kirtland's warblers, unfortunately, during the walk, but we did see a couple of other Bahamian species like white crowned pigeons and thick billed vireos. Um, we need to hold two more uh, as a part of this project. Um, and so far we have engaged the Bahamas' Ministry of Tourism. They will be doing some presentations on ecotourism and agritourism, um, which is tourism on farms, uh, which should hopefully appeal to more farmers. Um, particularly as Eleuthera continues to grow into a more popular tourist destination. 
um, and as ecotourism and birding opportunities become more popular across the globe. Um, we'd also like to have a third uh, workshop specifically on marketing and advertising skill development, um, particularly so um, farmers have the option to advertise their, their places as ecotourism destinations at no or low costs. Next, please. And finally, uh, public engagement, of course, has uh, always been a big part of Kirtland's Warbler Conservation of the Bahamas. The Kirtland's Warbler has been studied um, down here for 20 years now. Yeah. Um, but the one of the most popular and well-known forms of outreach for Kirtland's Warbler Conservation in the Bahamas is the youth uh, calendar competition or the youth, youth artist competition that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I'm happy to say that Eleuther students have participated over the years and have had their art featured in the final calendar. Last year's cover, front cover uh, or grand prize winner was a third grade student. His name is John from Tarpon Bay Primary School, which is a, a small school in um, Rock, in, uh, sorry, Tarpon Bay, South Eleuthera. Um, two other students from Eleuthera were featured in the calendar as well. Um, and this year we have conducted presentations and have received 33 entries from two schools in South Eleuthera to, uh, to the competition. Um, next, please. Um, oh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Giselle. And yeah, we'll pass things over to Sean uh, with American Bird Conservancy. Sean, take it away. I know we're we're running a little over, um, but we'll we'll do our best to get through with a few minutes past the hour, and uh, we'll see if we have more folks still uh, with us, which is great. Um, so we'll take a moment to answer some questions as well uh, once you wrap things up. Thanks so much, Sean. Great. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Um, next slide. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team and the activities that are that are moving forward. So, so starting in 2014 and 15, um, you know, uh, folks started to realize that that it was very likely that Kirtland's Warbler was going to be delisted uh, at some point. It had reached its recovery goals, and so the the conversation started to change around. Uh, you know why you know we need to move from recovery to how do we sustain and grow uh, the population so the recovery team um, many of the members of the recovery team decided it was, it was appropriate to, to form a new team that would focus on the future and that team was the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team in 2016 they established their first charter it's not an official organization it's a loose knit network of, of all the partners the, the federal state agencies the nonprofit partners, the universities, uh, and individual citizens, and even some industry that, that, that are engaged in this effort. And their purpose is really to provide um, continuity for the conservation of Kirtland's Warbler moving forward. And their mission uh, was to steward communication and cooperation amongst the partners to ensure the long-term sustainability in the breeding, uh, uh, wintering, and uh, migratory uh, stopover habitat. The structure is very simple. There is a steering committee, which is made up of representatives from the various agencies, nonprofit groups such as my group and, and Bill's group, um, as, as well as parties that are interested, such as universities that are doing research in the area. And then from the steering committee, we have several subcommittees that are working on this. And we have a breeding um, uh, season subcommittee. We have a non-breeding season subcommittee. Uh, and we have a human dimensions uh, committee uh, subcommittee working on, on things. Each one of these committees has developed a work plan uh, to help uh, facilitate work moving forward. So the work that Giselle was describing, for example, that's going down uh, on the wintering grounds of the Bahamas, uh, most of those activities that she was describing are things that are in the work plan for uh, the, uh, the, the uh, wintering ground um, subcommittee. And then, then of course, there's our sub working groups under some of these committees. So for example, I work on the expanding the Kribbles Row uh, Range Breeding uh, Committee. Uh, this is the group that Bill described earlier that our goal is to get the populations to expand in the UP of Michigan, Wisconsin, Ontario, and, and maybe even eventually into uh, uh, Minnesota uh, to create what, what might be described as the lifeboat, God forbid something happened in the main core breeding ground. Um, and, then, and then at times various ad hoc committees can come up as needed. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, each of these subcommittees has developed a work plan, and they are now going through the process of, of implementing those, those work plans. 
Um, and to help facilitate that process, uh, the American Bird Conservancy was fortunate enough to receive a, a generous grant from a Michigan-based foundation to, to help facilitate this work getting done. So we hired Dave Ewart. Many of you might know Dr. Ewart. Um, he is our American Birds Conservancy's um, Kirtland's Warbler Program Director, but he has spent 40 years working uh, on Kirtland's Warbler. Um, and, uh, and he was charged with taking the work plans from the three subcommittees and bringing those together into what you see here as the Kirtland's Warbler Business Plan. And this middle business plan is really the model for how we're going to move forward long term. This is a, a living, breathing document that we update on a very regular basis as conditions change. And this is a we decided to have a very adaptive management you know, process for this. So as we learn more information, things change. God forbid there's a pandemic. How do we adjust to those needs? So the business plan is updated quite regularly. Um, um, and and the, the conservation team uses this as sort of our guide as we move forward. One of the elements that Bill talked about earlier was the Human Dimensions um, Committee. Uh, and this was a, a new committee that wasn't part of the, the recovery plan, but it was very important, as Bill was talking about, that we make sure that people understand the importance of the species and the work that we're doing, and that we have people understand um, uh, all the aspects of this. It's more than just outreach and, and communication, it's, it's the policy side of things. We also work very closely to identify those threats and, and, and how do we mitigate for those, those threats. So for example, when the pandemic hit, we understood that there might be some conditions on the ground. We might not be able to get as much management on the ground as we thought we could uh, in, in, under normal conditions. So how do we address those things? So the conservation team meets regularly to discuss those types of things. And as I mentioned, one of the most important thing in the breeding area here that we've identified in the business plan is how do we, um, how do we expand that out, out, of, out, of, out of the core range? Uh, so we have an active committee working on that and identifying resources and where we should be working. Last but not least, one of the most important things that came out of this, this work plan, the business plan, is the need to build that, that conservation fund for the Kirtland's Warbler. This would be an endowment in which eventually the endowment would be large enough that that, that um, interest off of the principal could be used to help with management, with cowbird control, with, with aspects of breeding grounds and aspects of wintering ground activities. Uh, there is a fund that has been a cre created. It's actually a, a several funds that are out there right now. The state of Michigan actually is holding two million, a little over $2 million in funds that was from mitigation uh, funds, as well as a million dollars that was put in by your former governor in Michigan. Uh, thank you. Uh, so they're sitting on a fund right now. That fund is growing. We're not using that fund. It was primarily used, supposed to be used for cowbird control, but um, cowbird activity has minimized in Michigan. So Right now, they're using that fund. They're growing that fund, become a little bit larger. But if we can't, we don't have to use it for uh, cowbird bird control. We can use it for management. Um, and the American Bird Conservancy has started a, a fund as well. So we've, uh, over the last two years, have been able to raise a little over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Again, our goal is to get a, a minimum of five hundred thousand dollars in place before we start drawing interest off of that. Next slide, please. So moving forward, uh, a lot of interesting things going on that the conservation team is working on uh, through our partners. Um, again, this is all partner based. Uh, in, uh, the, the, like I said, the, the conservation team is not an entity, it's, it's a network. So we rely on our partners to carry these through. So, so uh, industry, uh, industry um, um, the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, partners in Canada, um, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service are all working on long term experiments. The idea here is that jack pine is not a, a, um, a species of trees that that industry loves. Um, they will use it, but it's not a product that is used in a lot of building materials or, or resources. So the idea here is, is how can we change the dynamic of, of our jack pine structure that make it more viable for industry as, as well as are there techniques that we can do that make make it uh, make jack pine thrive in a different way that would uh, would help with um, with always creating this dynamic forest that we need that that Bill was describing. So as those jack pine age to that 15 year um, uh, lifespan and they're no longer suitable for for uh, Kirtlands, how can they move to these these young stands? And those young stands need to be relatively close to where those older stands are. So there's a lot of work going on in this. And one of the areas that we're looking at is red pine, which is a more reliable species for the industry. Is there ways of interplanting uh, red pine within uh, these jack pine stands? 
and make the harvest of, of these stands when time comes more viable? And then how will the birds respond to that? So next slides, please. So there's a lot of experiments going on. And as I said, we're credit, they're trying to create these dynamic forests that, 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 that you might see here. So this is just a map trying to show how one project manager is trying to lay out management areas adjacent to existing jack pine that has habitat. So in the lower section of the slide here, you'll see that da diamond pattern. That is an area where, where jack pine management has happened and where we have occupancy. And that the area to the north that is green, which has all those, those, uh, those um, shapes on those areas, that's a future management area. So the managers are breaking that up into different management areas and doing different methods of management in each one of those areas with low density, high density, medium density, as well as interspersing red pine in there uh, to see uh, what would the effect be when those birds move from the, the occupancy area to the south. Hopefully they'll move to the occupancy to the north. I'm pleased to say that one of the early experiments that was done in Wisconsin in Adams County in the last census last year was, was done just for this purpose. And, and I'm pleased to report that this last year, in fact, Kirtland's Warbler moved from an aged out jack pine stand to this new experimental stand in Wisconsin. A lot of work still needs to be done to, 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 to verify that this is working, but it was a, a positive sign. So why don't we move on to the next slide? And I'll try to go through these very quickly, but let's talk to you a little bit about how the, the, the um, conservation team works. Um, so as I mentioned, we have monthly uh, steering committee meetings, but twice a year we get together with all the partners, agency partners uh, at the state and federal level, um, the nonprofit partners that are engaged in this, uh, citizen scientists who, who are engaged, uh, a whole variety of folks. And we even invite basically the whole family of people who are interested in, in Kirtland's Warbler to these meetings. Um, prior to COVID, we met uh, twice a year in person, uh, spring and fall. During COVID, we went remotely. And I'm pleased to say that last fall, we did a hybrid meeting where we came together uh, both in person as well as had a, um, um, a virtual um, um, feature as well so that people could uh, join in remotely. These are the uh, opportunities for the, each of the committees to come in and report out what's happening in each of the areas. And, and we can have a dialogue as an entire team to talk about successes, failures, uh, what do we be, need to be doing next, and, and doing course corrections. Next slide. And I just wanted to say that, that um, uh, of course, it's, these the teams are, are heavily populated with uh, folks in Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, but we have not forgot about our partners in the Bahamas and, and, and Canada. So, so we have representation on the steering committee and on these subcommittees of representation from the Bahamas and our partners in Canada as well. Next slide. So one of the other things that the steering committee does is when we get to when we do have the opportunity to get together in purpose in, in person, excuse me, we do also do field trips to get people out in the field to see some of these experimental areas and understand what's going on. So here was a field trip from a few years ago at Camp Grayling to understand what was going on at Camp Grayling. We've had other field trips, for example, where we have looked up at the experimental areas that are happening in the Hiawatha National Forest and understand what's happening there so that we can take that information and move it to the Ottawa National Forest where we're trying to expand that breeding range, for example. Uh, next slide. Um, and, and as I've mentioned, you know, uh, uh, there's only so much, it's expensive to do this type of work. And if we can get, if we can get industry uh, to um, find uh, jack pine to be more valuable uh, a resource, we can, we can expand where we're working and how we're working. So Warehouser, which has a facility uh, in, in Grayling, uh, Michigan, for example, actually uses jack pine as one of the elements of an engineered board that they manufacture. So, so we're, we've been talking very closely with them in terms of, of you know, how they work, learning from industry what they need, and again, incorporating those, uh, those aspects into um, how we manage uh, and how we can work with them to help tweak how they manage some of the sites that they own and or, um, uh, or, or um, work at. Um, last but not least, I just want to mention part of our success with this conservation team is a couple years ago, we were able to get funding, American Burger Service was able to get funding from a private foundation, along with funding from the Forest Service and a little bit of funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service to be able to move forward and hire a coordinator on a part-time basis. I'm pleased to say that for two years, uh, Kirsty Heidenreich has been our, our coordinator. Uh, this is a critical role because you can imagine all these agencies, all these nonprofit groups, 
Um, uh, this is not their day job. They're all sitting, they, 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 they come together to make this all happen. The coordinator has allowed us to really amplify the amount of work and keep our, our projects moving forward. Unfortunately, Kirstie's last week with us was last, or last day with us was last week. Uh, for family reasons, she moved to Wisconsin and, and had to step down from her post. But I'm pleased to say that through the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, ABC, the Wisconsin DNR, the Michigan DNR, we have now successfully raised enough funds that we can move this coordinator position to full time. And, um, and we've secured funding from a local foundation that should cover 50% of the cost of, of this position for at least three years. And we've got handshake commitments from other partners. So, so we're looking at, uh, at opening the position up and rehiring our coordinator position here in the very near future. So with that, because I know we're running out of time, I'll stop there and thank everybody for your time. So much, Sean, and thanks everyone for hanging on with us um, as we go over by a few minutes here past the hour. Um, I will pass things over. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, to Emily, I, we do have some calls to action we'd like to share with you, um, but we'll we'll see if we can also take a moment to answer some questions while uh, our speakers are still here. Um, but I'll, I'll take a couple minutes to to give you some information about how you can get involved. Um, both Sean and uh, Bill mentioned that there are ways you can become parts of different committees. Um, to help support Kirtland's warbler conservation if you have certain skills. Um, so we encourage you to visit uh, both the conservation team website and Kirtland's Warbler Alliance website for more information. Um, you can also receive Kirtland's Warbler Alliance newsletters and then support your local conservation organizations. Uh, all those partners Sean mentioned that are part of this conservation effort uh, can use your support and you can also support your local public lands and this uh, dynamic management that these birds need to thrive. Um, additionally, these are a few upcoming opportunities or events that you could participate in that are related to the Kirtland's Warbler and celebrating our uh, Kirtland's Warbler here in Michigan. Um, one is a volunteer day uh, to plant jack pine, and that is on Saturday, May 7th, and we do have a registration link to share with you in the chat. Uh, every year, also, the first uh, Friday and Saturday of June is the Kirtland's Warbler Festival, so this year in 2022, uh, that will be June 3rd and 4th, and we also uh, encourage you to follow the Kirtland's Warbler Festival pages for more details and updates. Um, and then you can also sign up for a guided Kirtland's Warbler tour if you have not yet seen one of these amazing birds here in Michigan. Um, those are led by Michigan DNR and Michigan Audubon, and we have a link uh, for those as well in the chat. Erin, can I just uh, interject? If, if you are at all thinking about the uh, Kirtland's Warbler tour, uh, make your reservations ASAP because they will sell out very quickly. There, there's already uh, a lot of interest in the tours and the slots are filling up. So make your decision and get on uh, and, and make that reservation. Great. Thanks, Bill. All right, and I will pass things over to Emily. We still have over uh, 150 folks with us um, on Zoom. So I think we can take a couple minutes to answer some questions um, since they're still here with us. Hi everyone, thank you uh, so much for joining. Thank you, a big thank you to our panelists uh, for the wonderful information. Uh, we had a lot of great questions come in through the chat. So I'm going to uplift a few of those. Uh, the first is uh, for Bill. Can you um, talk about how many broods a year does the Kirtland's Warbler have? Generally speaking, one. Uh, there are there are birds that pairs that have two broods a year, um, but it, that's the exception, not the rule. Thank you, uh, Aaron. I'm wondering if you might be able, be able to answer this one. Uh, and panelists, feel free to jump in. Uh, what does the term warbler mean? Is there a reason that birds are called warblers? Go for it, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I'm, I'm not an expert but, at all, but I just want to use this opportunity to plug a really great feature on the Audubon website called Ask Ken, K-E-N-N. -N. Ken Kaufman is a leading expert on birds, and this is a wonderful feature on the Audubon website. Somebody asked this question of him a while ago, I, um, uh, last year, I want to say last year, early last year. Uh, so search that, and he goes into 
great depth in terms of what a warbler is. But in general, warbler, basically the term warbler just means any, anything that warbles, uh, which is basically has a warbly song type of thing. So you could be a warbler if you wanted to be. Uh, but the term in terms of birds are these uh, small insect, insectivore, uh, passerines, uh, songbirds um, uh, that, um, that are basically um, a family, a suite of birds. Uh, um, and maybe somebody who's a better expert at birds than I can, can elaborate a little bit more. So uh, I'm going to throw in, pick up on one thing that Sean said. I am a word geek, total word geek. I have <laughs> on my phone the uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary <laughs> app, and it says definition, one, one that warbles. So, you know, <laughs> but um, actually it, 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 what we refer to as a warbler here in North America is, uh, comes from the uh, European family. There's a, a group of birds in Europe called warblers um, that are closely related to the thrushes. And I'm certain that like some other terms that have come across from Europe, warbler was one of those. Thank you so much. We're gonna share the Ask Ken link uh, in the chat shortly. Um, that's a fun question. Uh, this one is, I think Sean, but panelists, feel free to jump in. Is it possible to build a man-made structure uh, for a breeding area for the Kirtland Warbler? So we, we received a couple questions from folks who were interested in things that they could potentially do in their backyard. Yeah, so that, um, um, that has not been experimented on that I know of. Uh, I could be wrong, but but you have to look at the the structure of where these birds uh, breed. And so to try to do something in your backyard probably wouldn't be practical. As Bill described earlier, they 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 kind of hang together, and they need this large landscape. Uh, they they cue in on these large landscapes. So we're talking we're talking you know hundreds of acres at a time that they like in terms of. What, what, what seems to be desirable. And then in terms of man-made structures, uh, even as an experimental standpoint, um, uh, you can imagine how expensive creating man-made um, elements would be compared to just hoping that jack pine would grow and thrive, right? Uh, so um, I will bring this up to some of our scientists who are working on, on you know, expanding the breeding range to see if anybody has thought about this, but I don't know of anybody that's doing that. Um, so Bill, have you heard of anybody? Thinking about man-made structures? I have not, and I would be a little bit skeptical simply because uh, Kirtland's warbler prefers to nest on the ground, so it's not like they would go into, into a, a right. uh, cavity structure like a, a bird, uh, um, some kind of box, and um, they nest on the ground and they want to be on fast uh, draining soil, so if there's some place where they would prefer to be, it, they want to be you know, if there's something underneath them, like wood platform or something that would not allow the wood, the water necessarily to drain through. Thank you both. Uh, this one is for Giselle. Uh, how have hurricanes and extreme weather in the Bahamas affected Kirtland's warblers? So, um, Kirtlands usually come down uh, after the peak of hurricane season. So hurricane season runs uh, April, sorry, June 1st to November 31st, but the vast majority of hurricanes uh, happen in August and September. Um, they do happen in October occasionally, which would um, affect them as they are migrating, which is usually October-ish. Um, and uh, But I guess kind of a, a benefit of hurricanes is that hurricanes do um, open up the coppice habitats and tear down bigger trees, which uh, basically um, allows for regrowth of those successional species that I spoke about in my presentation, um, which is good for the Kirtland's warblers because then they have more things to eat. Thank you, Giselle. Uh, one last question because we are running over time. Thank you to everyone again for sticking with us uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, this one is for Sean. You mentioned that the cowbird numbers have been minimized. We had a question uh, as, was this an organized project? Yes. So, and I, I want to preface that by saying uh, cowbird uh, populations have declined drastically in the upper reaches of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Uh, they still are an issue um, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, so, so a lot of work still needs to be done. Uh, to minimize the, the, the population. But there's been a concentrated effort um, for a very long time, since, since the mid-70s, 
to trap and control uh, cow, cowbirds. And over time, um, the populations have, have dwindled. Um, so, but it, we're, we're constantly monitoring that because again, if the populations of, of cowbirds starts to increase again, we will need to start going back to a regimen of trapping. So again, this is an adaptive management process that we're going through. Um, so we, we experiment, we look, what, we look at what works, we move that, those experiments forward. So over time, we realized that, that the trapping that we were doing was so successful that the populations have diminished. Um, uh, but we might need to step that up again. Thanks again to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. I'll pass things over to Aaron Rowan, who will close us out. All right, thank you so much, Emily, and thank you so much, Bill, Sean, and Giselle for being with us today. Um, I'm just gonna share some ways folks can stay in touch with all of us um, after the presentation today. Uh, you can like and follow all of our uh, pages on social media. So American Bird Conservancy, Kirtland's Warbler Alliance, the Bahamas National, uh, Natural uh, Treasure, sorry, Bahamas National Trust. I'm seeing your, your little uh, logo there <laughs> that got me, um, as well as Audubon Great Lakes and Michigan DNR. Uh, we'll be continuing to share updates as well um, through MyBirds and Audubon Great Lakes newsletter on upcoming webinars and in-person events. Um, and if you want to contact uh, the Bahamas National Trust directly uh, to learn more about their work, you can reach their science team using that email address, as well as Bill um, with Kirtland's Warbler Alliance at that other email address. We thank you again so much for spending your lunch hour with us and hanging out after the hour. Uh, we will be sending a recording of this session out to all who registered, along with some of those links we shared in the chat. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Bye.